on um, a suffix day yantip, which is the second day. And the second part is that how is, how is this different from um, the situation when it runs into a Shabbos where, um, for example, in Hawaii, where there's a Shiloh of the dateline, um, you keep, you don't do malacha on the, on the suffix Friday, but you wouldn't say the brachas of Shabbos on that Friday. How are they right, so the question is, uh, when Chazal enacted, that because of uh, Sveika Dioma, because of the calendrical doubt uh, in Chutz Laaretz, you have to keep two days of Yom Tif. So we actually make all the brachas. We make Kiddush, we daven Yom Tif davening. And uh, the normal rule is that if you have a doubt, uh, you, do, you might do a mitzvah, but you don't say the bracha, just like a dateline issue. When you're Masupic, which day is Shabbos? So uh, you observe any extra day beyond the Psach uh, without a bracha. Uh, without Kiddush. So why don't we say the same thing for the second day of Yom Tif? Uh, so, so again, the short answer is that if you would simply be keeping two days because you have a doubt, we would apply the rule of uh, Suffolk Bracha Lakula. When you're in doubt whether you have to make a Bracha, you don't make a Bracha. But here, the Chachamim made an enactment. They positively enacted that you must keep two days. So it turns out the second day is a takonas chachamim b'teres vadai, meaning I don't keep the second day of Yom Tif because of calendrical doubt. I keep the second day of Yom Tif because the chachamim said I must keep the second day of Yom Tif even though their reason was because of a doubt of the calendar. Once it becomes a rabbinic obligation, it is no longer a suffix bracha, it's a vadai bracha. And of course, you may ask me the question, but if I'm only keeping it rabbinically, then how can I say, Asher Kiddushanu b'mitzvosav v'tzivanu, that God commanded me? Well, uh, this is uh, the Rambam answers that. Uh, we make that formula for every drabban. We make it for reading Megillah. We, re we make it for Nir Hanukkah. Because since the Torah says, you're mechuyiv to listen to the takanas of the chachamim, so every time I keep a drabbanan, I am fulfilling a mitzvah di'araisa of the lav, the negative commandment, of lai sasur mikol ashe So the point is, that Yom Tif Sheni is not a doubtful Yom Tif. Yom Tif Sheni is a Vada Yom Tif, albeit its Kedusha is, is Midrabanan. Is that uh, two questions? Or? Yeah, that's, oh. um, yeah, that's the first Okay, two, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, what were the merits of Rahav that she married Yoshua? Yeah, so the question is uh, Rahav, right? Rahav was a Zona. Now, it's very, very interesting. Rahav was the one who protected the two spies who went to check out Yericho. And eventually, Rachav converted, and she married Yehoshua, according to Chazal. So first of all, let me point out that it's very, very interesting. She is described as Rachav the Zona. So what does it mean, Rachav the Zona? The normal translation of Zona is quite literally a prostitute. Uh, but uh, Targum Yainasan, who is the Aramaic Targum for the Nevi'im, uh, translates Zona as a pudakis, that means an innkeeper who supplies food, zona. Uh, now, maybe Chazal did it that way, that she shouldn't be called a prostitute, or whatever, or they understood that she was not a real prostitute. But if you're asking what was her uh, merit, I mean, uh, it's hard for us to understand, but number one, her merit was that she had such a muna in Hashem's promises to the Jewish people that she was willing to put herself in very, very, very great danger to give uh, shelter to those two Meraglim. They, if the Canaanites would have found out that she did that, they would absolutely kill her. Uh, and uh, therefore, in that Mesira Snefesh, in her willingness to give up her life because she believed in Hashem's promises, she was Zochet to a very high level, a very, very high level. Now, um, we have to assume that uh, this was the tip of the iceberg, that she had many, many other Zuchuyos as well that are not necessarily recorded but this is the one that is recorded, her Mesiras Nefesh, her willingness to die because of her faith in, in Hashem. Yeah. What's the importance of Shir Hashirim that you would say before Shabbat? Yeah, yeah, Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs. Um, I just actually, I quite literally just finished giving uh, some Shir I'm just on the way here, just uh, in Shir Hashirim. So it's very, very fresh in my mind. So. You have Ruach HaKodesh or, or, or something. Uh, uh, basically, Shira Shirim, you know, almost didn't make the uh, Tanakh. Uh, there were rabbis who wanted to exclude the Song of Songs because the Song of Songs is, is romantic. It is erotic, although in a gentle way. I wouldn't call it hardcore, but it may approach uh, softcore. 
And there were those who felt that it was not appropriate uh, for the holy Tanakh. And yet the one who saved it, the one who saved Shir Hashirim, was Rabbi Akiva, who said that if all of the songs or the poems in the Tanakh are Kaidish, Shir Hashirim is Kaidash Kedashim, because it's all a mashal, the metaphor of human love, of passion, of sexual energy, is really describing Hashem's relationship to B'nai Yisrael. So the woman that is looking for her lover is Klal Yisrael, that in Golos wants to be reunited with Hashem. And the lover, the raya, the shepherd, who is also described as king, he actually is given two contradictory titles. He's called Melech, he's called Roa, that refers to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And therefore, all of the yearning and all of the passion and all of the, the ecstasy and the sadness at separation is really describing Klal Yisrael in our ups and our downs. So, for example, there's a scene in Shir Hashim that's very dramatic in which the woman has gone to sleep and after she gone, she's gone to sleep, her lover is knocking at the door and begs her to open up the door. And she's playing hard to get and she says, I'm already asleep, you know, what do you expect me to do? So he leaves and then she gets up and looks for him and she's beaten and abused and people make fun of her. This is the idea, Hashem wants to redeem us. Hashem is knocking at the door, but we don't have time. We're too busy with all the other things that we do. But then at some point we get into a war and we say, oh gee, I want Mashiach, I want Mashiach. Hashem sometimes says, well, now is not the time. When we're ready, he's not. When he's ready, we're not. Right? So Shir Hashem is very powerful because it's describing the love that Hashem has for us, the love we have for Hashem, the yearning for Geula. So we read it at very important points. We read it at the Seder, you know, after the Seder of Pesach because Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim was Hashem showing his love for us. Uh, we read it on Pesach, on Pesach itself in Shul, right? Shir Hashem is read on Pesach. Uh, so many people do have the Minog. In fact, it's in the Siddur that way that Shir Hashim is recited before a Shabbos, every Shabbos. Because once again, Shabbos is a day of love. Shabbos is a day of union with Hashem. Uh, and therefore, we celebrate that union by reading of the passion and ecstasy and sometimes sadness in that yearning, in that relationship. So Shir Hashim is all about the passion of love, but it's a mashal for the relationship of Hashem and B'nai Yisrael. And that's why it's Kodesh Kedashim. And that's why you have to understand something. The Gemara says in Sanhedrin that anybody who takes a verse of Shir Hashirim, puts it to music, makes, it, makes music out of Shir Hashirim, doesn't have a share in Olam Haba. Now, people ask the obvious question. We have a number of Nigunim that are from Shir Hashirim. And, uh, you know, they're from, I mean, for religious people sing them. I, the Gemara says you're not allowed to make Shir Hashim into a song. So you have to understand what the Gemara means. The Gemara does not mean there's something intrinsically bad with putting Shir Hashirim to music. I mean, after all, Shir Hashirim has a trap. I mean, there's an Agina anyway. But rather, you have to understand there were people, Jews and non-Jews, who understood Shir Hashirim literally as romance. And they would sing it as love songs, like popular music. That's what Chazal are saying. If you make Shir Hashirim, Stam, a music about Divrei Cheshek, then you don't have a Shir in Olam Haba. But if the Pshad is you make a nigan as a way of Divakus and Hashem, and you're thinking about the connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then it's perfectly good to make a nigan out of it. And Chazal are not condemning the nigan, they're condemning the context in which you use the nigan for romantic, uh, romantic love and the like. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, how do you decide who do you trust? Uh, in a way, uh, Gedolim are a little easier to identify because Gedolim tend to be acclaimed by a very broad consensus. So there'll be a lot of people who will say Rukhaim Kineski or whatever it would be. So you don't have the burden so much of making individual decisions. But where you do have a problem is, who should my Rebbe be? Who should my Posek be? You know, who should be the person that, that, that gives me guidance? Uh, who can I trust? 100% correct. 
I'm not suggesting that anybody will deliberately try to mislead you, although in the world there are such that as well, but Stam, who should be the person that you know, I, I depend on? Very, very difficult. In many ways, uh, finding a Rebbe, finding a teacher, finding a posek is similar to other decisions in life, such as who do you marry, right? It's a similar thing. Uh, you want somebody that knows you, somebody that gives you time, somebody who is attuned to the uniqueness of your personality, who will not simply give a one-size-fit-all universal answer to every type of question. And that sometimes is a trial, I, mean, I, don't, I don't have an easy answer to you, that sometimes is a trial and error type of effort. So you go to classes, you go, you know, you're, if you're in yeshiva, you have kind of a ready-made roster of people because you go to a lot of different people and then, you know, you'll figure out, like, who do you think is the best person? Uh, will your decision be correct? Not necessarily. Sometimes you'll have to reevaluate. <laughs> Sometimes you'll have to change your allegiance. But I think over time, you know, you try to kind of feel that this is the person, it may not only be one, but the, these are the people that I feel I could go to. You know, it's in, yeah, I'm sorry. Who's the postic of our generation right now? Um, I, I cannot say that we have the postic of our generation. It's unfortunate. Uh, we have some great, we have some very great postic. Rav Usher Weiss is a very, very hush of a postic, and he would certainly be up there. And there are other people as well. But I don't think we have anyone, you know, the definitive Posek. There are times in Klal Yisrael where we don't have a definitive. We don't have a Rav Yosef Yosef Svardin or Rav Al Yashiv. Uh, even Rav Chaim Kineski right there was not the Posek there. He, he, he did not, you know, give himself that role. But, but whatever. But uh, he may be the Gadol Adar, but he wasn't the Posek Adar. Uh, so there isn't. But, but again, that doesn't mean there aren't people you can go to, right? Just, you know, so you don't have to go to the Gadol Adar. In fact, the Gadol Adar may not be the best person for you. People say, I have to hear it from the God of The God of the doesn't have time for you, uh, usually. Uh, you actually need people, you know, on a lower level who can spend time with you, and then they could go to the God of Lador if they need clarification. You know, I remember reading in the 1970s, this is really very, very cute. Um, I don't know why Rav Moshe Feinstein agreed to this, but somehow the New York Times interviewed him on his 80th birthday or something. <laughs> I really don't know why he would agree, and I'm not, I'm not even sure if the story is true because it just sounds like a little strange to me. Uh, but uh, he did an interview, so the story goes, and like the reporter asked him, you know, uh, you know, you're like the rabbi everybody goes to, like, how did that happen? Like, why do people go to you? <laughs> so Rav Moshe, in his very, very sweet and endearing way, uh, said... Uh, you know, somebody asked me a question. I give him an answer. Uh, he feels it's a good answer. So he tells other people, hey, you know, there's this rabbi that gives good answers to questions. So he says, after a while, there's a lot of people that, uh, <laughs> a lot of people that come, you know. It's not, and he said, it's not that I'm better than anybody else, but, you know, uh, whatever. There's a word of mouth. Actually, I heard from my own Rosh Hashiva, Rav Yaakov Weinberg, is that so, uh, who was the brother of Noah Weinberg, uh, who's more famous in Israel, in Asia Torah that he grew up in the Lower East Side. This, this goes back to the 1930s. And he says the reason why uh, everybody was asking Trefa Shilas as a chicken kosher to Rav Moshe is that every other Rav was charging a nickel per chicken and Rav Moshe was doing it for free. Uh, so that's, uh, that's another way you build up. <laughs> you build up a clientele, but Russia didn't want to charge for Paskening, Paskening Shilas. Now again, though, I, I prefer to look at this not that he was trying to get business. That wasn't it. I think that he felt that he had a responsibility to Paskin for people. So he didn't want to you know, get money for it. It was a really a sense of responsibility. And therefore, people went to him because they saw that he cared enough about them that he wasn't trying to. I mean, not that they were making big money on the chickens, but you know, he, he went an extra step in, in providing that service without uh, compensation. Yeah? Your descendants, if someone is killed just because they are Jewish, do they have the din of Harude Malchus? Yeah, so this is a very, very dif difficult question. If somebody is killed because they are Jewish, you know, you are killed because you're a Jew, you didn't get into a car accident or something, uh, are you in the category, well, normally the way they ask it is slightly different language, but it's the same thing. Did you die al Kiddush Hashem? Right? There's a special category for people who died because they are sanctifying God's name. Uh, they are called sometimes, if they were killed by the government oppression, 
Harugei Malchus, and it says they are in the highest level of Eilam Haba. There's no tzaddik that can compare to the level that they're in. Now, in the paradigmatic case of Kiddush Hashem, the person had a choice. That's where Antiochus you know, says to Chana and her seven sons, bow down to this idol or I will kill you. And the child says, I will die before I bow down to the idol. Now that is a paradigm of Kiddush Hashem. I sanctify, I am, I am so committed to HaKadosh Baruch that I'm willing to die, right? So that for sure is Kiddush Hashem. The problem is, let's go, let's go to the Holocaust, the Holocaust itself. We often say that uh, the six million Jews who died in the Shoah, in the Holocaust, they died al Kiddush Hashem. We call them Kedoshim, we call them sacred people. We say they died al Kiddush Hashem. Now, number one, keep in mind that many of the people who died in the Holocaust were not religious, that's one thing. But number two, I mean, besides that point, even a religious person, it's not that he was given a choice. You know, if Hitler would have said, convert to Christianity or I kill you, yeah, if I say I'm going to die, that's Kiddush Hashem. But that didn't help you. If you converted to Christianity, you went to Auschwitz. In fact, there were Jews who converted to Christianity who died in concentration camps. In fact, one of them is a saint in the Roman Catholic Church. Edith Stein uh, was a Jewish woman who became a Carmelite nun, unfortunately. Uh, that didn't help her. She was... Uh, uh, sent to Auschwitz. She died in Auschwitz. And the Catholic Church later made her a saint because she died as a martyr to her Catholic faith. Now, how can you call that martyrdom to Catholic faith? I don't understand because she didn't die because she was Catholic. She died because she was Jewish. So the question is a very excellent question. And that is, if I don't have the element of choice, I'm, I'm being killed because I'm Jewish, but I'm not making a choice. Is that called sanctifying Hashem's name. And that called Kiddush Hashem. And that could apply to a lot of scenarios. It applies to the Holocaust. And in our very sad and difficult situation now, it applies to Hamas as well, in which Hamas really doesn't care. In fact, mar marginally, I suppose, if you're ultra, ultra religious and a member of Naturi Karta, maybe you'll be on their good side, although you know, I kind of doubt even, even that. Uh, so the question is, is this called Kiddush Hashem? Um, it's a hard question. So, so to be frank, there are going to be those who say it's not Shaykh a death al Kiddush Hashem unless you had a choice to get out of it and you elected out of your loyalty to Hashem not to take the escape route. There are those, however, that often quote language from a letter of the Rambam. It's not in the Mishnah Torah, but it's in one of the letters of the Rambam, where the Rambam dealt with a community under persecution, that anyone that is killed because they are a Jew, by definition, is sanctifying God's name in their death. Now, the Emma says that's an interpretation of a particular language in the Rambam. Uh, I don't have the language in front of me, but... The, la the language lavdafka means that. Uh, it's not, it's not muhrich. It's not like 100% clear that the Rambam is saying that, but that is how the Rambam is often, is often interpreted. So according to that, many do say the Haruge Shoah died al Kiddush Hashem, and again, uh, the people that... Uh, well, let me differentiate. The people that died defending Eretz Yisrael, I think that is the Kiddush Hashem because they're making a choice to defend. The question is victims who didn't make any choice. Uh, so many would say, based on this Rambam, that it is Kiddush Hashem. The question is why. The question still is why. In other words, what's the logic of it? So there are a few different approaches. One approach is that when Hashem brings a Midas Hadin into the world, he brings the attribute of judgment into the world that basically says that if the Jewish people as a whole are not as a whole, I'm not talking about individuals, and not keeping the Torah, things happen. That itself is a Kiddush Hashem because it shows the truth of the Torah and the truth of the Tochacha and the words of the Torah get fulfilled. So even a Russia in some ways, and God, I'm, not, I'm not describing anyone as a Russia, but I'm just saying, but theoretically, even a Russia could die al Kiddush Hashem because they were a vehicle 
to manifest the truth of the Torah, the awful, awesome truth of the Torah. And that itself made, means they were a vehicle for Kiddush Hashem. But other than that, it's a little difficult to fully understand. Now, I will mention another perspective that doesn't apply in every case. Uh, this is an essay by Rev Dessler. And I think I mentioned last time, in response to a, to a question about Kellum and, and the like, uh, Rev Dessler grew up in Kellum, the famous German-Lithuanian border city, which was a great, great center of Musser, the altar of Kellum. Rev Simcha Zissel was Rev Yisrael Salanter's maybe primary Talmud. And he created a school that was based on Musser and Midos. And uh, he died uh, at the very end of the 19th century, but the school remained, the yeshiva remained, until the Holocaust. And Rev Dessler had already left to England before World War II. So Rev Dessler was in uh, England during the uh, years. But all of his family was in Kellum. I mean, not his wife, but, but his, uh, other than his wife and children, they were in Kellum, and they all were massacred. They were massacred in a Nazi massacre. And there were very, very few survivors. But there was a survivor that was able to give Rev Dessler an eyewitness account of how the Jews in Kellum, connected to the yeshiva, went to their deaths. And Rev Dessler gives a very, very moving description of how I had mentioned the other day that the whole Avaida of Kellum was to foster a sense of serenity and calmness. You don't get agitated. You don't get upset. You look at each minute and you ask, what does Hashem want me to do this minute? And the head of the yeshiva asked the Nazis, you were going to mow them down. Can you give us five minutes? Interesting. So the Nazi gave him five minutes. And he spoke. You know, Rav Mashevitz spoke you know, quietly with a lot of dignity to the Talmudim and said, we're about to die now. And we have to know that we're giving our lives to be a kapara for Klal Yisrael, whatever that means exactly. And we are korbanos. And we have to realize that all of our lives we were living so we would serve Hashem every moment. And now we have to serve Hashem in this moment. And there was calmness. And um, it was so powerful that even the Nazi executioner was kind of spooked out. He had never seen people facing their death with such a calm spirit. And he kind of hesitated. He asked his commanding officer, you know, can we just let this group go? Just let them go. And the commanding officer said no, and they were then mowed down. But Rav Dessler writes, that's a different aspect of Kiddush Hashem. It's not that you had the choice to escape death, but how did you confront your death? Now, again, that, that, that doesn't apply in every case either. But Rav Dessler writes, that is another aspect of Kiddush, Kiddush Hashem. So it is a complicated question. It's not an easy question. Uh, now, again, we have to be careful because uh, the very last thing in the world we want to do is to denigrate the people that have died, the people that are suffering. And, of course, we pray for them, we daven for them. But that question was not asking about that. That question was simply asking, do they automatically get the, de get the designation of Haruge Malchus, Kiddush Hashem? So that, I think, is a bit of a debatable question. Yeah. Um, so on this issue of, of, of definitions, the Torah might say something like, Abraham is Hesed and laid out explicitly out for him. But can we then extract out from like Chumash or whatever a definition of test that then we can apply across Chumash or even apply outside like in that sense? Or can we only trust that the text itself has the proper understanding of it and only it can truly apply it in that sense? And when we encounter attempts at definitions in Rishonim and Achronim, how should we, how should we, uh, how should we approach it? Well, you know, I, I think by definition, anything that is reported in the Torah is intended to be what you might call grist for our mill, meaning we're supposed to think about this and ask ourselves, how do I apply this to my life? To simply say, oh, it's, it's only that and nothing else would in effect uh, take away the whole purpose of putting it in. Mm -hmm. So I think by definition, we have to extrapolate from the concept of test some type of definition that could apply to us in our situation. Uh, the only cautionary note I would say is we have to do so with a lot of humility, knowing that we don't know for sure. We look to Chazal, we look to commentaries, uh, we look to Das Torah, but, but, but with all of those things, there is also a certain 
subjective element that you have to bring in. You have to apply the Torah. This is a little controversial, maybe, but I think it's obvious, but, but some people don't, don't like to say it this way. You have to use your own mind and your own, mor your own moral sense sometimes to apply the Torah to your life. Now, uh, yes, you have to be makabel chazal, and you have to look at rishonim, and you have to look at achronim. But there's going to be maybe a disconnect between the final application and all of that material uh, that you've learned, and you have to bridge that gap with your seichel and your understanding and your life experiences, and you have to bring your individual identity to how to apply these values to, to, to our life. In fact, um, I've mentioned, again, I've mentioned this. By this time, anything I say, I've probably mentioned many times before because I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, around uh, now, well, he's been there for a long time, so this was probably 50 years ago, decried, 50 years ago or more, he decried what he called the Hasidification of the Litvisha Torah world. What does that mean? He says, you know, he came from the, the Litvisha Yeshiva, Slobodka, the altar of Slobodka, and he says that the goal in all of those great Litvisha Yeshivas, Mir, Panovich, Slobodka, Baranovich, Grudna, these are the great, you know, great, great Litvisha Yeshivas, was to give you the ability to make your decisions, to be able to have independent judgment based on all the Torah that you learned and the Das Torah that you absorbed. He says, Hasidim had a bit of a different Mesora in which you handed everything over to a Rebbe. That had not been the Mesora of the Litvish Yeshivas. But he pointed out that in recent decades, Litvaks have become Hasidim, in which, you know, Rav Chaim Kinevsky, whoever has to decide everything for people, and people lose the ability to make their own decisions. And Rav Yaakov held that that was a Chisoran, a person, a good Rebbe, a good Rebbe should not foster a culture of total and constant dependence. A good Rebbe should, like, like a good parent, like a good parent, should give you tools and abilities to make decisions. And every once in a while, you need to consult. That's very true. That's very true. We all have, we all have to consult. I say, look, Rav. But it shouldn't be like, I can't do anything without, uh, without checking. Uh, you should be able to make decisions based on what you learned from your Rebbeim and based on what you learned from the Torah. So there is a role for autonomy, independent judgment, uh, and, uh, and, and the like. That's an important point. In fact, um, Rav Shlomo Yosef Seven has a beautiful little word on this. He raises a stira. There's a stira in Chazal regarding Rabbi Eliezer, the great Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkinus that one Gemara says he never said anything that he didn't hear from his Rebbe. Right? He, he would not say anything if he didn't hear it from his Rebbe. Then there's another Gemara that said he would say chidushim that were so wondrous that even Moshe Rabbeinu didn't hear it on Har Sinai. Now those are totally opposite statements. One is he never said a chidush. And the other is he said amazing chidushim. So Rav Zevin takes the question. Of course he said new things. Of course he had original thoughts. But every original thought was based on the foundations that he absorbed from his Rebbe. You see? So it's not a contradiction. Uh, you're not uh, a machine, meaning you, you, you have your mind, you have your thoughts, and that's important. But it should be foundationally based on all that you've learned from you know, you're part of the Masora. That's a big deal. We're part of the Masora. We don't think about it this way. You know, we look at ourselves, you know, we have Rebbe's, but we don't realize that having a Rebbe is not just having a Rebbe. It means you're part of a chain. It's a chain. My Rosh Hashim of Rudiman used to point out, now it's already fading for me, the exact Yichus, but he pointed out that he had Smicha from a person who had Smicha from the Vilna Gaon. So you had Vilna Gaon, you had Rav Abba Pasvalever, you had another person, I'm not sure, and then you had Rav Rudiman. So he said he was fourth from the Vilna Gaon. So he would tell us, that means yeah. every person in Nair Yisrael who got smicha from Rav Rudiman is five generations from the Vilna Gaon. Now, that was a while ago already, so now it's already uh, one or two more generations. But this is the idea. When you connect with a Rebbe, it's not just connecting with the Rebbe, you're connecting with a chain that goes all the way back. 
You see? So yeah, you got to be independent. You got to have your own judgments, but it also has to be connected to that Messiah. Rabbi Elazar ben Horkinus said, Gavaldagachidushim, but everything was based on what he got from his, from his Rebbe. Yeah. Yeah, so these are two questions about uh, the Kotel. Uh, one is the idea of 40 days, go to the Kotel for 40 days. By the way, many combine that with Shira Shirim for 40 days. <laughs> so going back to the Shira Shirim issue. Uh, but it is brought down in some sources that uh, because the Kaisel, well, the Kaisel number one, now remember, the Kaisel is not the Beis Hamikdash, obviously, and it's not even a wall of the Beis Hamikdash. At best, according to the overwhelming uh, she, uh, uh, Rishonim and Valve and Nachronim, the Kotel is the wall of the, or it's one wall of the Temple Mount. It is not a wall of the Beis Hamikdash itself, or even the Azari, even the courtyard of the Beis Hamikdash. It is the Harabayas, which is the outermost part. But nevertheless, uh, it is the closest architectural structure we have to the Temple complex. And there is a Medrash that says the Shekhinah has never left the Kaisel Hamaravi, the Western Wall. Many assume it's referring to the Herodian Wall that, that is there. And therefore, it's Mekubal in Klal Yisrael that the Kaisel is a place of Kabbalah's Hatfila. There's a certain, just like the Beis Hamikdash as a whole, Hashem accepts our prayer. So they argue, so there, there are Segulas that talk about 40 days. But the thing is, you've got to be very, very careful with Segulas in general. Skulos are never guaranteed things. Uh, there, in other words, it's ma'orer, a certain rachamim, but there may be, in the spiritual world, there is a constant, what you might call, calibration and recalibration of merits and demerits. I mean, I don't want to get into this question, but you know, the issue is people always ask me the question, oh, Chazal say, if you give tzedakah, you'll be rich. Uh, give miser. So how come I'm not rich? I, you know, I give Maser, I'm not rich. And you know, there are a lot of answers, actually. First of all, even a, a middle class person today is rich. Chazal did not mean you'll be Bill Gates or whatever it would be. So the truth is, I am rich. I have a roof, I have food. Uh, whenever I want, I'm rich. OK, that, I mean, that's a simple answer, actually. But the other answer is it's more complicated. Rechaim Konevsky said, used to say that the same way Maser is a school of Rashiras, other chatoim are a skula for anius. <laughs> Therefore, these are forces that are working against each other. So you're lucky that you're, uh, you know, middle class. Now, the, the thing that, in other words, the maser prevented you from being pulled into poverty or, or whatever it is. So the same thing is true with virtually any skula. To kind of assume that because I do something, it's automatic, it means it is a force for the good, but it could be counteracted by other things. Um, now, the idea of putting a petek putting a note in the Kotel. Uh, that is interesting. Uh, that uh, is not necessarily of such an ancient Makor. I, I looked into it a very long time ago. I don't even remember everything. Uh, that became kind of a custom. I, I wouldn't say necessarily it has a particular significance, except for the fact that it may inspire you. In other words, sometimes these ceremonial rituals make me feel a stronger connection to Hashem. So then what happens is it's your connection to Hashem that's doing it. It's not the, the petik itself. There were even some gedolim who were against it halacha, on halachic grounds because they claim if a Tomei person is not allowed to enter the shetach of the Harabayas, if, if that's the position that we take, then some say the cracks in the wall already have a din of the Harabayas, so you're not allowed uh, even to put your finger uh, in that particular area because we paskin that partial entry to prohibited areas is also going to be prohibited. So I, I wouldn't say that the Minog uh, has any real authority. And in fact, it's an interesting issue about davening in the Kotel generally. There were Rosh Hashivas. I mean, let, let's assume we were, that safety is not an issue. I mean, today, not, today we have different issues, but let's assume that it's totally safe and the like. There were, uh, there are, there are Rosh Hashivas and Mashkichim and Rabbeim and Rabbanim who actually don't encourage people to go to the Kaiso because they say, you know, if the Iker of your davening is Kavana, sometimes in the carnival atmosphere, 
uh, the kavana might be lacking. You might you might have more kavana in a in a base menu. Now th th that is subjective. I mean that that will differ with the with the person. So I'm, I'm not I'm not going to make a general statement. But it's something that you got to take into account, and that is, where is your kavana the greatest? And if your kavana is the greatest in a small place where nobody notices you, and that would be a bigger kavana than hundreds and hundreds of people milling around, then you shouldn't automatically assume I should go to the Kaisel to Davin. Now, again, as I say, uh, I don't want to generalize. For some people, uh, it is you know, profoundly very, very inspiring, and that's a different cheshman. But all I'm saying is that ultimately, your kavana counts more than the place. If you've got to choose between holy place and greater kavana, you choose your kavana. The interesting question is, as an aside, is, well, hmm, well, once I made that statement, what about tefillah b'tzibor generally? This is a real question. Many people will say that they daven better be echidas than with a minion. They say either the minion is too fast or too slow sometimes. Sometimes slow davening can take away your kavana too. Right? Maybe you don't realize. Um, or whatever it is. Uh, when I'm by myself, I can cry to God, but I'm embarrassed, uh, self-conscious to cry you know, with them with people. So if I just told you that in choosing between place and kavana, kavana beats place, so the logical second question you might ask me is, well, what about Sibor versus Kavana? Should Kavana beat out Sibor? It's a very, very good question. It's a very difficult question. And I, and I have a feeling that it may apply to quite a lot of people, in which at least uh, sometimes uh, they have more Kavana biachidas. But here, the psak is that uh, because there is a special merit in davening but Sibor, generally speaking, Tefillah but Sibor will override a more kavana biachidas, but it's interesting that I read a story from the Chazanish, and again, I'm not sure there was no halachic analysis, where a a a a person, a Talmud, presented this issue to the Chazanish. He says, "I daven biachidas, you know, I daven two hour shacharis or whatever it is, and you know, with a minion it's impossible, and I got to rush. So, do I have a hetter to daven biachidas?" So the Chazanish said, "You don't, but every once in a while." you can take off and do this. Meaning, I can't give you a hetcher every day to permanently daven biyachidas, but I think the Chazanish said, now this I don't remember, it was either once a month or once a week, but the Chazanish gave him a certain period of time, which is interesting. It's a kind of, you can fulfill your kavana in that particular way and hopefully can then carry over or spill over. But, but that's the Gabe tefillah with Sibra. But the Gabe going to the Kotel, I think we would, we would talk to say that Kavana would be more important. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a few questions about Kavana. Um, so, uh, after Shmona Esau, um, what happens when Kavana is not a Kavana? Tachanan? Oh, Kedusha, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, after Shmona Esau, well, well, a person's still davening. I've seen other people who are who are responding H and uh like and then like after uh is done they'll like take three steps back and you know it seems like they're doing it during the Kedusha. Um one is is that correct to do? And yeah, during in the middle they seem to be in the middle of Shimon Asra. Yeah. And they, then they, then they, uh, but they answer. Um, and also, um, if a person finishes Shimon Esrei, um, if if you don't do that, and you are finishing Shimon Esrei, um, should you like, should you like take three steps back during during Kedusha? Okay, so, so really, it really very much depends on where they are holding. Meaning, if you are literally in the middle of Shmon Esrei, meaning you have not said, es amo yisrael bashalom, you have not finished the 19 brachos of the Amida, of the seven brachos of Shabbos, there is no way at all you could answer anything at all. You don't answer Kaddish, you don't answer Kedusha. The only thing is, well, I'll, I'll mention two exceptions. The only thing is that when they're saying Kedusha, you stop davening, 
you listen to the chazan and have kavana that the chazan is being motzi. You. you under no circumstances answer amen, yehishmei rabba, or even kadosh, 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 right? Not at all. Now, the only exception, there's one exception to that. The one exception to that is if you're up to the kedusha in your natural davening. Let's assume you began with the chazan. So when the chazan says, Baruch uh, Hashem Hamesim, you have also said Mechayi Hamesim. You have said Mechayi Hamesim. So then you say you say the words of kedusha along with the chazan, including Lador Vador Nagid Gadlecha. So instead of Atal Kadosh, you actually finish the bracha the way the chazan. But that is the only exception. Now, what you probably saw, unless they didn't know the halacha, is they had already said, but they're in the middle of Elokai Nitzor. Now there, there are rules that you can answer Kadosh, 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 Kedusha, Baruch Kavod Hashem Mimkomo, Yimloch Hashem Liolam, although you don't say the, the middle passages. And then you would take your three steps back. Now, according to many, in order to do that, you have to say a Yihilu Ratzon first, meaning uh, after Amorach uh, Zorizol Shalom, you would say Yihilu Ratzon Imrei Fi, which is also going to be said later, but you say it there first, and that is the matter for you to answer those things. Now, if you're going to do that, you do not take three steps back then. You'll take three steps back whenever you reach it, and that'll be after the Kedusha. But until you've uh, done that, uh, there is no way that you answer uh, Kedusha or Kaddish. You just stop and, and listen. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, in terms of your Sephardi, um, and she did Ashkenaz Dab in terms of Nisach Ashkenaz, can you Dab in the same Nisach as um, Yeshiva? And if not, if you should Dab on your own, how does it work based on, like, let's say, you, you relate to Shachris and you have a lot more things to say, and then maybe you want, you want to say Shimon Esther at the same time as the Tibor starts? Right, right, right. So this is, uh, again, this is a, a question that uh, many guys are going to face, uh, in which, let's say, you're, you, you, you go to an Ashkenazi yeshiva, you daven in an Ashkenazi minyan, but your minog is svarad, either because you're a chassid or because you're a dutta mizrach, you're actually svardi. Uh, and the question is, uh, what nusach should you, uh, should you daven, uh, daven in? So Rav Moshe has a tshuva. Rav Moshe basically says that when it comes to the things that you daven as an individual, you daven your nusach. So you would daven a Sephardic Shemona Esrei. But when it comes to how you answer Kedusha, you should do the Ashkenazi Kedusha because since Kedusha requires a minion, it has to be based on what the minion is doing. So it's maybe a little confusing if you don't know it by heart. Meaning, you'll daven with a Sephardic sitter, but you'll answer Maybe you'll place it on a sheet of paper or something. You'll answer the Ashkenazic uh, Kedusha. And then you say Kaddish, although I see many Sephardim are not careful in this, but uh, in a Ashkenazic minion, the Kaddish should be Ashkenaz. And I'll say it the other way too. And in a Sephardic minion, the Kaddish should be Svarad. You don't say Kaddish the way you want to say it. You've got to follow the, the minute. Now, Rav Moshe does say there's one exception that's very fascinating. And that is, if you're a Shaliach Tzibor, then you should follow the nusach of the minion even in your silent shmones, right? Because the purpose of the chazan doing the silent is to prepare him for the repetition. And therefore, uh, if I'm Sephardi and I'm the chazan, both the silent and the repetition would be Ashkenazi. But if I'm not the chazan, my silent would be, um, uh, Ashkena- uh, would be Sephardi. And then the repetition, of course, whoever's doing it would be Ashkenaz. Now, the second part of your question was you come late and you have uh, a lot more stuff to say. Uh, well, it, it, it depends what, what you're talking about, meaning uh, does halacha allow you to skip it? Meaning, psuket de zimra, a lot of psuket de zimra can be abbreviated, meaning uh, in order for me to daven b'tzibor, um, all I have to do is baruch sh'amar, ashrei, yishtabach, and I can skip everything. So machlokas, if I make it up later, um, so karbanos can be said after davening, Me- meaning you, you really have to go over this very specifically, uh, that a lot of things can either be skipped for tefillah b'tzibor, or things can be said later for tefillah b'tzibor. So you don't necessarily have to say everything from page one to, to Shemona Esrei in order to be able to daven Shemona Esrei b'tzibor. So you try to 
he'll you know ask a pasak about uh, the specific things that you can say later. Sorry, what, what is still there? The walls collapsed, and, the, and what did you say? You didn't hear. The rockets were sitting in the walls of, of yeah. the UFO, and so, um, which is still there when, when they were collapsing the walls. And because um, the spies tell her to stay in the house with, the, with all her family, and how can it be if the walls were collapsing? Yeah, that's an interesting question, right? Rachav lived in the wall, that's what it says, meaning the wall was stick. By the way, you still see this even today. I'll give you an example of this. You won't notice it because they made so many openings, but Mea Sharim was originally a walled neighborhood because in those days, uh, there was like nothing outside of the, of the old city. And to live outside of the old city was extremely dangerous. I mean, Arabs would come in and even wild animals would come in. So Mea Sharim was one of the very first settlements outside of the old city. And it was a wall, a wall all around it. So if you're walking on Mea Sharim Street, Right, so uh, the side that has the unbroken, like unbroken houses, not with the you know, one side are stores, the unbroken uh, ho houses are the remnants of a wall. Now, now they made so many openings, you're not going to notice it, but since people live there, they're living in the wall. They're living within the thickness of the double wall of, of Mea Sharim. Yericho was the same way. Now, the question is that Rachav was told, because they were going to enter the city and kill Yericho, uh, or kill the, uh, the Canaanites, and Rachav was given a promise of protection, so she was told to hang a red uh, rope outside of her window, and that is how they would know that not to go into that house, and everybody in that house, her family, her relatives, they would be protected. So your question is very obvious, that Lechera, they walked around the walls seven times, uh, seven days, on Shabbos seven times, the wall collapsed, uh, well, how could Rachel be protected? She's in the wall. <laughs> I mean, basically, the whole thing collapsed. Yeah, that, that's a very excellent question. I, I think our assumption has to be that uh, not every part of the wall collapsed, meaning uh, everything collapsed to give the Jewish army total entry. We have to assume that uh, the part of the wall where she lived, that, that remained standing, because that was Vada Nichlo in the promise uh, that she would, be, she would be safe. But it is, it is a good question. Yeah. You know what Shem is Nechem Mitzavay Dover, but yet at the same time the Gemara says that Derech Shadim Ha'ikolei Merich Ha'ikolei, how do the two uh, work with each other? Yeah, so uh, the question is, again, I was asked to always repeat the question, the question is that uh, God determines the destiny of mankind. We say it every day, Ha'mechen Mitzavay Dover, He prepares the footsteps of man, and yet we also find that the way that a person chooses to go I choose to be a certain person. I choose to go a certain way. That is where Hashem takes me, uh, which implies that I kind of control the way things go as opposed to God controlling it, uh, which is it? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very, it is a difficult question, but the answer is it is actually both, meaning uh, God responds to the choices that I make in life. So what will happen to me is up to Hashem but Hashem interacts with my choices. And, and again, this is implicit, not, 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 I'm sorry, not implicit, this is explicit in the Torah. If the Torah says, if you do Averos, things will happen to you, that means by definition, I determine good or bad. So in a sense, HaKadosh Baruch Hu's yeah. ultimate absolute control over the universe is an interactive uh, development along with the choices that I make. So both are going to be, both are true at the same time. I have some questions about Tehillim number uh, Kuf Lamed Zion that is uh, a bit of a revenge fantasy. It's somewhat easy to imagine this language that we're going to, you know, raise them to the ground. Yep. The daughters are going to get annihilated. Is uh, yeah, yeah, a yeah. bit similar to what Hamas might be saying amongst themselves. If you're going to say, well, we were unjustly oppressed, they made their own bed, but they're probably saying the same things about themselves. And then furthermore, I think most of us can agree that uh, among the most shocking and upsetting of the attacks are the attacks on babies. A baby, uh, 
far from not even being chayev, it doesn't even have bechira. A baby could grow up to make tshuva and reject the ways of his parents, whatever they are. They're not Amalekites in the in this Tehillim. But here we are saying that, you know, when we uh, get our revenge, we're going to smash the babies on the rocks. Yep. How, how, are we, uh, how are we any better than that? Yep. Uh, yeah, this is uh, just just to be sure people know what uh, chapter you're talking about. This is 137, as you said, and this is the famous chapter, Al Naharos Bavel, by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat and we wept when we remembered Sion. And uh, in many Sidurim, in fact, all Sidurim, it actually says that before you do benching during the week, so on Shabbos you say Shir Hamalos, but during the week you say Al Naharos Bavel. Now, unfortunately, I think the meaning of Al Naros Pavel uh, is not as commonly practiced as Shira Malos. Everybody says Shira Malos. A lot of people don't say Al Naros Pavel, but Lamaisa, they're of the same halachic or minhag weight. Now, uh, just a side question Al Naros Pavel is obviously describing something that's way after the time of David Amalekh. When David Amalekh lived, there wasn't even a first base on Mikdash yet. The first temple was not built until Shlomo, and yet this is discussing uh, the Jewish people after Nebuchadnezzar destroyed uh, the first base of Mikdash. So there are different interpretations of how you reconcile that with David's authorship of Tehillim. Either David authored this with prophecy and Ruach HaKodesh, so he's actually describing a future event, or, or Tehillim, as Chazal themselves say, can have multiple authorship. David is the author of the core of Tehillim, but there were kapitel of Tehillim that were added later. But be it as it may, you are 100% correct that the tone of some psukim, not, not all of them, the tone of some, in fact, the famous verses, Imeshkachech Yerushalayim, Tishkach Yemini, that's there. If I forget Yerushalayim, right? All, that is in our Al, Al Neros Bavu. Those are beautiful, meaningful, moving psukim that to this very day we recite at a chasna before we break the glass. Imeshkachech Yerushalayim. But there are some other psukim that you're uh, very aptly describing as a revenge fantasy that superficially sounds like something Hamas would say. You know, happy is the person, fortunate is the person that will take your babies and smash their heads against the rock. I'm not exaggerating. I'm just, I'm just quoting in translation what the verse says. And that is a very, very, very shocking pasuk that a Jew, and not just a Jew, David HaMelech, or whoever wrote this, people with Ruach HaKodesh, people with greatness, people with Kedusha, would have any type of thought with enthusiasm. It would be a wonderful thing to take a baby and smash it against a rock. How could that be? How could that be? So again, I'm, I'm going to have to admit to you that uh, this is something that has perplexed me for a very long time. I don't have a great, I don't have a great answer. I mean, the answer I can give you, I can give you an answer but it's not really an answer because Hamas might say the same thing. I mean, that's always the problem. The answer would be that this is describing not something that is right and not something that is good, but it's describing the depths of despair that a person can reach when contemplating the magnitude of suffering. So, for example, after the Holocaust, one might imagine, I mean, one might imagine someone saying, if I had, you know, Hitler or some Nazi kid in my hands, I would just take to smash him against the rock. Not that they actually would, but it's kind of the feeling of rage and helplessness and despair that can overwhelm a person. But as I say, you know, I might be able to live with that if just a regular guy just said such a thing. But when we're talking about Kisve HaKodesh, we're not just talking about passing human emotions. There has to be some spiritual token in it. So I don't, I don't have an answer. Uh, it, it truly, truly uh, disturbs me. Now I know all of the Torah that he who is merciful on the, uh, on the cruel will eventually be cruel to the merciful. And that's Amalek and everything else. But still, uh, the way this is expressed, first of all, the notion of happiness is, is Bechlaum is placed. Because Shlomo HaMelech said, do not rejoice in the downfall of your enemy. When the Egyptians were drowned in the Red Sea and the angels wanted to sing Hashem's praises, Hashem said, now is not the time for rejoicing. Now, this is a very important point. Judaism is not pacifistic. It's very important to understand that. We don't believe in turning the other cheek. The halacha is very clear. 
If somebody's coming to kill you, you kill them first. And that's true on an individual level, and it's certainly true on a communal level. You go and you do what has to be done. We do not say, be a nice guy. But at the same time, it has always been characteristic that we don't, glee, we don't have glee in the destruction of even enemies. We actually have a certain element of sadness that it's come to this. And a wish that it didn't have to come to this. And a wish that there could be tshuva and there could be other alternatives. Just as Bruria told Rabbi Meir, don't pray for the death of the wicked. Pray that they do tshuva and then there are no averas. So th that pasuk itself is in very stark contrast to the notion that you don't take glee in the destruction of the enemy. So it's very, it's very problematical. It's a, it's a good question. I, I wish I had an answer. Yeah? So we always say that everything that happens is for the good. And if Hashem wants it, it will happen, which means that Hashem runs the world no matter what. So if someone has to work seven days a week, 20 hours a day, logically you should become successful. Does Hashem allow someone who gives his all to something, uh, success in that matter, even if it's not the right thing for the person? If yes, then how is that not a contradiction? And if not, that doesn't really seem like a fair God that would allow someone to work like a dog and then not give him success. So how do we get out of that problem? Yeah, so, so I think the thing to understand is this. The idea that everything God does is for the good does not mean it's for the good as I define it. Uh, so, for example, I work very hard and I'm still poor. And I ask myself, I thought everything God does is for the good. Well, yes, it is for the good. It is better for you to be poor. Now you have to figure out why. Maybe if you'd have money, you get too involved in business and, and the like. Uh, there is sickness. There is illness. So it's unrealistic and Pollyannish to say every story will have a happy ending in the sense that I'll be happy with it. But everything has a meaning. Everything has a purpose. And, and it's an interactive purpose. Let me, let me give you an example. Let's take Sara Imenu. This week's parsha, Sara. So Sara was an akara. Sara didn't have children for many, many, many years. Now, not only Sara, but Rivka was an akara. Rachel was an akara. And they prayed over many years, and God answered their prayers. And the Gemara Yavama says, Why are our matriarchs barren? Because Hashem yearned for their prayers. And therefore, he created a circumstance where they would die. Now, Let's imagine Sarah would have made the following cheshman. Sarah would have said, wow, it is so tough being barren, but if God made me barren, it must be for the good. So I accept God's decree with simcha and amuna shalema. And people would look at Sarah who is heartbroken over being barren and they would say, what a righteous woman. She accepts God's judgments without question. But you know what Hashem would be saying? Kaviyocha. Hashem would be ripping out his hair and saying, she's missing the whole point. I made her barren so she would daven. And now she's saying, I accept. Meaning like this. The gamzu latova of Sarah being barren was not that she should be barren. It was a way to bring her to tefillah. See what I'm saying? In other words, sometimes the gamzul latova is it will lead to something that needs to be done. Now, because of Bechira, you may not make the right choice, and then it becomes a dead end. But that's up to you. So that's why davening has a place. People always ask the question, well, if everything God does is for the good, and God didn't give me something, then why should I daven for it? Uh, it's not for the good. The answer is, it is for the good if you daven for it. God didn't give it to you because he wanted you to daven. You see? So, the big question in life, this is a very big question in life, is, okay, when is my attitude that what Hashem has given me is good and I should accept it? And when is my attitude I should daven? Like, when do you move from plan A to plan B? Difficult question. There's a story with Yaakov Kamenetsky, and I've mentioned the story before, about um, a child uh, who had a very, very serious illness. And the parents took the child all over the world to different doctors, different hospitals, different clinics. And because they were from, they also went to different rebbies and, and Hasidish rebbies and schoolos. 
And they finally somehow got to Rav Yaakov. And they told Rav Yaakov the whole story over two years, what they were doing. And Rav Yaakov asked them, do you have other children? And they said, yes. And Rav Yaakov said to them, may Hashem give you nachas from your other children. And as he basically told them, your son is going to die. Now, Rav Yaakov, besides being one of the ga'inim of our generation, of, of the past generation, was an extremely sensitive person. He was a ga'in in Midas, as great as he was a ga'in in Tyra. So people were shocked. They could not believe. Here you have parents that have a child, and his message is, okay, you have other kids. Get nachas from them. He's going to die. How do you tell parents such a thing? And you don't give them encouragement. The child did die a short while later. And the parents actually said they were very, very grateful to Rav Yaakov because he gave them the green light, so to speak, to you know, give their child his last few months in peace and tranquility in his own bed with his own friends, his siblings, instead of just going place to place to place to place to place. And he died surrounded with the love of the people that he cared about. And they said... They couldn't give up as long as they thought something could be done, even though it was bad for the kid. Rav Yaakov told them there's a time to give up. There's a time to move to acceptance. So basically the idea is it's connected to miracle, meaning if there are still things that B'derech HaTeva work, that's where prayer comes in. But Rav Yaakov held that prayer for Maisa and Nisan, now some people argue with Rav Yaakov in this, particularly in Eretz Israel, but he says prayer for miracles is not within your purview. And once it would take an open miracle, that's when you have to accept. You accept God's will, and God will do what he wants. So it's a hard situation. But, but all I'm, this is very, a very long-winded answer, but I'm basically saying that gamzu tova does not mean don't daven. Sometimes the tova is, it'll spur you to connect to Hashem through tefillah. So you have to define what is the tova in what Hashem is giving you. Uh, yeah. I have a uh, legal case that you can offer an opinion on. Say that there's a... I may, I may charge for that one, but okay, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a halakhic legal case, don't worry. Oh, good. Um, yeah. Say that there's a fellow bidding on Rosh Hashanah for, uh, you know, go up and say an aliyah, and he says a bid, and the auctioneer says going once, going twice, Zaha, and at the moment he says Zaha, somebody else bids higher. And the auctioneer, is the, the, so I have three parts to my question. One, does the auctioneer go with the Zaha, or does he go with the higher bid? Two, if, whatever is the correct answer, because I don't know, but if the auctioneer chooses the wrong one, does the guy who is, who is wrong have a complaint with the auctioneer or with the guy who bid against him if he wanted to, say, take him to Beit Din for the 10 gold coins for each bracha. And the last part of my question is, does somebody actually have reshoot to go after these 10 gold coins today? And if they don't, then how did we uh, lose the permission? Yeah, yeah, that? yeah, yeah. So, so the thing is that um, there is a principle that you can rescind transactions if you act within what is called toch kedei dibor. So, for example, I marry a woman. I say, Harei b'kadeshes li and she accepts it, but I could say toch kedei dibor. I'll, I'll give the share. So, no, I changed my mind, you know. Uh, now, toch kedei dibor is a very small amount of time. It's the amount of time in which you would, you would say the words, shalom alecha rebbe, or some add shalom alecha rebbe umori, which would add, you know, two syllables. So it seems that what you're describing, even though the auctioneer said Zocha, he, ex and again, maybe, maybe this is not the case, he accepted the, 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 the higher bid, toch kedei dibor, of uh, his uh, accepting. So as a result, it would be a legitimate chazara, a legitimate change of mind. So the second guy, the higher bidder, uh, would get it. Now, since it's an auction, uh, the idea of ten, ten zehuvim, let me just be sure people uh, are aware of, of what's going on here. This is a Gemara that says that if somebody had the right to a mitzvah and you took it away from him, 
So the Chachamim enacted a certain kanas, a certain penalty, called ten gold pieces, whatever whatever that means exactly. Uh, so an example would be um, that if I'm a father and I want to circumcise my son, which I have the right to do, so somebody know how to do it, I'm a moel. Have you ever seen this? Sometimes the moel, I mean, it's formality moelim do. They'll, they'll talk to a father who's like shaking and quaking. They'll, all, they'll give him the knife and say, you want to do it? It's your mitzvah. And usually the father says, no, no, you, you, get, you, get, you can be my shaliach, and the like. But let's assume dad is about to do the bris, and some moel shows up, and he just pushes dad away and does it. So technically, he owes dad ten zehuvim because it's dad's mitzvah and the like. So, but here, in the context of an auction, uh, since by definition auctions are open to high bids, as long as the auctioneer had the right to be choser, tochidei dibor, there would be no asar zehuvim. Now, if the tochidei dibor share had expired and, and the auctioneer gave it. Or let's say the auctioneer made the wrong decision. Or made the wrong decision, yeah, yeah. Then it may very well be that uh, the person would owe, not, not the auctioneer, but the one who took the mitzvah that didn't belong to him. Not the auctioneer. Wouldn't be the, the, wouldn't be the auctioneer. It would be the person who took it uh -huh. uh, because he took a mitzvah that didn't belong to him. He may have to pay ten zehuvim. But today we don't do ten zehuvim. Uh, the reason is because it has the din of a kanas, meaning it's not a monetary damage, it's a fine. And bizman is where we don't have real semicha. A based in doesn't have the authority to paskin dine kanasais. Right? We don't do kanas unless you have real ordination. So we don't we don't do that today. Yeah. Uh, here's another question. In Gemara learning, what is a raid and why is it controversial? <laughs> is the word raid English or yes? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. A raid is spelled. It's not R A I D. Although you know it makes sense. The War of Torah. Uh, we use military imagery. But raid is R-E-Y-D, and it's totally Yiddish. Raid just means speech. Redden is to talk in German and Yiddish. So red is simply the common yeshiva Torah that is discussed in advanced learning of sugya. So for example, in any given sugya, there are certain, at least on an advanced level, there are certain famous things that everybody talks about. Every shir we'll talk about. It. Uh, there may be the Erev Chayim, there may be a, a ra famous Rambam, there may be a Katsos or a Mesidim. So raid simply means the conventional types of things that virtually every Ian shir will talk about. That's all. Uh, the reason it's controversial, well, it's controversial simply because, um, like all Ian, it's controversial because some say by focusing on the red, you know, you want to kind of build yourself up as being in the know when you don't really have Pashat Pshat in the Gemara and the Rashi and the Tosa. So people, people want to, in advanced yeshivas, you sometimes see people want to jump the gun. You know, Gemara, Gemara is too boring. Gemara and Rashi is not interesting enough for me. I need to immediately get into all of the lumdas. But of course, getting into the lumdas without having the foundation is crazy. It's like you're building a, a hundredth story without having 99 stories under it, it's all going to collapse. So raid is not inherently controversial, but it's controversial in the sense that people use it as a way of bypassing pshat and, and the like. I think Rabbi Tonic says, Rabbi Tonic has a, an expression that says, he hates lumdus. Now by that he means that he wants people to focus on getting basic pshat before they get into the fancy, interesting, so-called so -called interesting things that people want to talk about. Yeah. Notice that between Yaakov's sons, uh, Don, God, Asher, and Naphtali specifically aren't given as much attention. Um, so my question to you is, could you give some cool facts or stories about those four, <laughs> those four sons? Yeah, yeah. So of course, uh, Don, Asher, God, Naphtali are, are not the children, not the direct children of Rachel or Leah. They are the children of Bilha and Zilpah who are uh, described as the concubines of, or the maidservants of Rachel and Leah. So that itself would already indicate maybe a little bit of a, a secondary importance. On the other hand, uh, we have, uh, again, there's, there's quite a lot of chazals uh, about uh, building up uh, these people. I mean, Asher, for example, was very, very great in Torah learning. Uh, and uh, Dan uh, Shimshon, uh, 
who was controversial, but Shumshin was a great shofet who came from Shevet Dan. Uh, we have what? Uh, God uh, was also, uh, God, of course, lived east of the Jordan, right? So that was, in a way, a negative factor. Uh, but again, I, I'd have to, I, I, I could look it up and maybe put together a booklet or something, but there, there's, there's quite a lot. Uh, every Shevet of Am Yisrael is necessary. Keep in mind, in the Chalukah Sa'aretz, there was no discrimination between the Bnei Shvachot and uh, the children of Rachel, of Rachel and Leah. And in fact, this was Yosef. One of the, you know, Yosef brought Lashon Hara about his brothers to Yaakov. And, okay, that one may be sinful, you don't bring Lashon Hara, but one of the things that Yosef wanted to bring to Yaakov's attention is they were treating the children of the maidservants with a lack of respect. And that was a serious enough Avera that Yosef felt that Yaakov had to know about it. And as far as we know, that Yosef was correct. That was not an Avera on Yosef's part. He got in trouble because Mechiras Yosef had to happen. But uh, Yosef held that this is not Lashon Hara to report such an offense. Yeah? Yeah, I think it's tonight and tomorrow. Is that right? Yeah, Thursday, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting about how we constantly, like, she's Mama Rachel. Mama Rachel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to me, it's like, yeah. yeah. Uh, tonight I, is, I, I believe, uh, Rachel Imein is your side, and uh, Kever Rachel is closed mm -hmm. because of the security situation. I think they have one group of people who are allowed to go, but that's about it. Uh, the crowds that would normally go are not allowed to, to go. You can s say again? They're, they're allowed to go. Oh. Wow, well, that's amazing. So the fact that the army would have that sensitivity is uh, something that's moving in and of itself. Uh, but Rachel was, was a very tragic figure. Do you know that according to the Cheshven and Seder Olam, Rachel died at the age of 32. She died in childbirth, giving birth to Binyamin. She was only 32 years old. Yaakov lived many, many, many years after Rachel died. And on his deathbed, he still remembered Rachel. He still thought of Rachel all of those years later. Quite amazing. And yet, in so many ways, Rachel died young. Rachel had to wait. Well, she didn't, she didn't wait seven years. It's interesting, just to be sure you understand the chronology. Yaakov made a deal that he would work for Lavan seven years and then marry Rachel. So Lavan pulled the switch so instead of being with Rachel, Yaakov was with Leah. Now, in order to get Rachel, Yaakov had to work another seven years. But, but, but you have to understand, if you look at the Chumash, you will see that didn't mean that he didn't live with Rachel for seven years. He actually just uh, married Rachel a week later, but then had a commitment to work another seven years. So in a sense, he got Rachel on credit. So the difference between... Rachel and Leah is only one week. It is not seven years. But still, uh, she didn't have the schuss of being the first wife. Um, she didn't have children for many years, although Leah was very fertile. And when she had uh, children, she had Yosef, who was uh, sold. And then uh, Binyamin, uh, Binyamin uh, she died in childbirth. Well, actually, Rachel died before Binyamin. Uh, Rachel died before Mechibus Yosef. Right? And of course, she's not buried next to Yaakov. Right? Next to Yaakov is Leah. The wife that the Torah apparently says literally, Yaakov hated. Although it's, it's over Pasha, it doesn't mean hate in the way we would, we would say it. 
So uh, in many, many ways, Rachel's life was a very, very sad life, a very tragic life. But that's exactly why she is the designated person that prays for the Jewish people to be redeemed from the Gullahs. She suffers, and because she suffers, she has empathy. She knows what we go through. She knows, therefore, she can go to God out of the pain of her own life. She can then kind of generalize it to the pain that we all suffer. And that, that's her, I mean, that's her task. Her task is maybe a hard task. Her task is to feel pain and be mavakish rachamim. Now, the truth of the matter is, Leah, too, had a lot of pain in a different way. Leah had the pain of rejection. You know, look, look at the names that she gave her children. You know, it says Yaakov says hated her, although, again, as I say, that's a relative term. I don't think it's an absolute term. So, Reuben, you know, God has seen my affliction and has given me a son. Shimon, God has heard my pain and given me a son. Levi, maybe now my husband will like me or accompany me because I've given him three sons. And then number four, Yehuda, now I am grateful. There are different ways of looking at it. Rashi says she was grateful because there are four wives, so she figured we'd get three sons. Number four is more. But you know, that's what Rashi brings. But I would suggest that her gratitude is more of a resignation to her fate. Meaning for the first three sons, she kept on hoping that her relationship with Yaakov would change, and it didn't. So she says, I'm grateful for what I have. See, see what I'm saying? How, how, how to understand Hashem? Meaning I'm not going to focus on what I don't have. I'll focus on what I have. So, in many, many ways, there's a Pasuk in Kehelas. Elokim Yevakesh Sanirdaf. God is on the side of the underdog. God is on the side of the one that was pursued. The fact that Leah was a sunua, whatever that means, gave her certain brachos from Hashem as compensations. But you're right, Rachel's life is a very, very tragic life. Um, some, some understand it this way, but you have to develop the thought. I, I don't have a full development. They say that Rachel was the wife of Yaakov. But Leah is the wife of Yisrael. Meaning, once Yaakov's name is changed, it's a different type of relationship. And Leah is the wife of Yisrael. Yisrael, which means to excel, is connected to Malchus. Malchus based David and the like. And therefore, the Malchus based David and Mashiach ultimately comes from Leah, but there is a Mashiach ben Yosef who precedes Mashiach ben David, and that comes from Rachel. And it mentions Amalek can only be destroyed by Rachel's children, not Leah's children. Right, so there, there is a role in both of those things. Yeah? Um, people like, uh, is there any source in Chazal or Jewish thought or even Jewish law for people like Joe Lieberman and him being in politics and making a change in America. On the same token, the second part of the question, uh, is, is there any source for Rabbi Johnson Sachs uh, is sort of working with teaching Torah and trying to help the outside world, the more general world? Yeah. So I'll tell you, uh, Joe Lieberman, uh, he should be well, was um, my parents' senator from Connecticut. And uh, you'll recall that um, he was Al Gore's vice presidential candidate. And my wife tells me, my wife tells me this, that uh, Hadassah Lieberman, his wife, was at a Hebrew Academy event, a school event, because her, their daughter went to the Hebrew Academy. Mm -hmm. And when people were talking to her, she said, <laughs> it's hard to believe, she said, pray that my husband doesn't win election as vice president. She had to say, pray. <laughs> she, <laughs> that's an interesting, must be an interesting dinner table conversation. But she absolutely did not want him uh, to be vice president or to be in such a high elective office, uh, because potentially that could backfire against the Jewish people. In some ways, people made the argument that if a Jewish guy is too pro-Israel, he'll be seen as uh, you know, kind of a 
prisoner to Israeli interests, so he would have to bend over backwards to be objective, so ultimately, you know, it might hurt Jewish causes. And of course, you also have anti-Semites who might kill him. So she actually was, uh, she said uh, she didn't. But if you're asking me generally, uh, is there a, a problem, uh, is there a Torah problem with a religious Jew being involved in an attempt to make society a more just society, a non-Jewish society, a more just society, uh, in theory, there is no problem, and in theory, it's even a good thing. Because remember that under the Noahide laws, B'nai Noach are supposed to create a just, this is the seventh Noahide law, a society of justice. And therefore, when I help Noahides create a just society, I am fulfilling a legitimate Jewish role in helping non-Jews live in Noahide society. So in theory, that's perfectly fine. In practice, it is fraught with danger, especially if you're a Democrat, uh, simply because uh, the particulars of a democratic agenda, or really, really almost any political agenda, are often going to be in very stark violation of the Torah. And you're going to have to take positions by virtue of your office uh, that may be against Jewish values and Jewish ethics. And you'll even have to say, well, yes, I believe in Judaism, but the office requires that I take certain positions. So it may not be the appropriate venue, even though in theory I think it, it would be good. Now, uh, Jonathan Sachs, I think, is in a better position because Jonathan Sachs is, was not occupying a political office. He was occupying uh, status as teacher, as communicator. And I think he fulfilled some very, very valuable service to the Jewish world and to the non-Jewish world by taking foundational ideas of Judaism and showing how they could be applied to world culture to kind of elevate uh, society and elevate the discourse. So in general, I think that's a very good exercise. Once again, however, people did criticize Rabbi Sachs, uh, Lebracha, that sometimes in order to make his message palatable, he had to water down the Judaic content or distort it. I don't want to get into the specifics of that. that. That would be a matter of controversy. I'm not sure if he would agree with that characterization. But that's always going to be the question. The question is, yeah, you want your message to be go out there. You want it to be accepted. You want it to make a difference. But if you tell it in its unvarnished form, people might not accept it. So what do you do? You water it down. You distort it a little bit. Well, you know, the Torah doesn't belong to me that I can simply reshape it in ways that make it sound more politically correct. So those are the dilemmas that people like Rabbi Sachs are, are going to face. But overall, I think the uh, intention was good, and I think uh, the overall idea of trying to effect that type of change is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, these are hard questions. Um, I, I would say this, that um, the Rambam says that there are three categories of what you would call obligatory wars, mitzvah wars, that you're obligated to wage. One category is the eradication of Amalek. The other category is the eradication of the seven nations that inhabited Canaan. And the third category is a war of defense against an enemy that has attacked us. Now, the Rambam writes that Amalek, we really don't know who Amalek is. So we don't have that one. The seven nations of Canaan are extinct anyway. There's no Amorites around. So the only category of uh, mitzvah war that we have is a war of defense. And indeed, the war against Hamas is a defensive war. You know, 
we were attacked, and, and, and over a thousand uh, people were mercilessly slaughtered, as well as people taken captives. Now, the Rambam then says, I'm just going to, I'm kind of just quoting or paraphrasing the Rambam, that even in a mitzvah war, you have to offer the enemy an opportunity for shalom. And shalom means, in this context, uh, the acceptance of the seven commandments of Noah, as well as Jewish sovereignty. And the Rambam then says, if they do not accept the peace terms, which includes both seven commandments of Noah and Jewish sovereignty, so then there is a mitzvah to eradicate everybody, man, woman, child. That, that's what it says. However, however, many, many commentaries understand that that only refers to Amalek and the seven nations. And that's still a big chiddush. That means even Amalek gets a chance at Shalom. You see, the Rambam is actually being liberal. <laughs> Amalek gets a chance to stay alive with Shalom. But when you're dealing with a defensive war, as opposed to Amalek and the seven nations, where there's no direct mitzvah of eradication, there's only a mitzvah of defense, then indeed you would not kill deliberately. You would not deliberately kill non-combatants. Now, we do have to differentiate two situations. One is where the non-combatant is used as a human shield, or whatever it is, uh, their collateral damage. So it is true that if in order to get the enemy, I have to indirectly inflict civilian casualties, that would be permitted. And by the way, I hate to say this, it should never be. It would even be permitted if it's Jewish civilians that are going to be killed. Because I'm not targeting the civilians. This is an enemy I have to uproot. However, to deliberately target uh, non-combatant civilians, uh, unless they are of the seven nations of Canaan, or Amalek, uh, would not be proper because a defensive war is permitted only to the extent necessary to achieve its objective and not, not beyond that. So it is true that the Rambam does talk about wholesale slaughter of man, woman, child, but that is in the context of Amalek and the seven nations where there is a mitzvah of extermination that is not referring to defensive wars. And in fact, proof to this, I'll bring another proof from Ramban, Ramban actually says that when we surround a city, we have to leave an avenue of escape, meaning we, we have to allow people to escape. Now, there's a machlokas, why is it important to leave an avenue of escape? Some say so that non-combatants can leave, just exa which is exactly what Israel has done, uh, imperfectly, uh, to be sure, with the, you know, the Gaza escape routes, which really depends more on Egypt than us. Uh, others say they need an avenue of escape because otherwise they're going to fight with greater ferocity. But, but be it as it may, I think the idea of Ruach Reviet, which the Ramban counts as a mitzvah de Raisa, does indicate that you don't deliberately target the civilians. Uh, although, as I say, they can be killed as collateral, collateral damage. In fact, this is the excruciating problem Israel has right now. I mean, they're not asking Shaila halakhically. But this is, you know, Hamas can play this game. I mean, like they're, they're the biggest tzaddikim in the world. They take 200 uh, plus hostages. So they're such tzaddikim because they release, look how, you know, they release them. You know. Yeah, they release them. I mean, what, um, under what grounds do they have the right to take them? Uh, but uh, Hamas saying, well, you know, you can't bomb us. We're in the process of negotiating for hostage release. Well, at this, uh, at this rate, you know, uh, one hostage, you know, every week or something, you know, they have... Uh, they have around a year and a half uh, to kind of, kind of regroup. But this is very excruciating. Uh, on one hand, we care about the lives of these hostages. We care and we want them back. We need them back. We pray to have them back. On the other hand, if this is going to give Hamas breathing time to kind of rebuild and regroup, we might be creating a much, much greater future danger. And sometimes the military objective says we have to get rid of this enemy even if it means there'll be a certain amount of korbanas. Again, I absolutely hate saying that, but that's going to be the same halachic issue as prisoner exchanges, exactly, exactly the same issue, prisoner exchanges. So what are you going to do? You're going to get uh, somebody free, Gilad Shalit, free by releasing terrorists who in a few years will go back and kill, as indeed one of the leaders of the Hamas operation was a terrorist who was freed in the Gilad Shalit. So halacha actually says 
that in the mitzvah of saving lives, we don't necessarily do things that are going to endanger future populations. Right? And that, that's the problem that we're facing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is, is there a level of, uh, let's say, you know, moral corruption of, among a populace that would allow for widespread destruction? Like, the, the, uh, I'm sorry, you're asking me if, if that would be indicative of a moral rot? It, is, is there such a level that exists of, yeah, moral rot where we, like, there was in, like, the campaign? Like, well, you know, you know I, I don't want to impugn people's motives. I mean, people are looking for a, a way out of this, and this is one of the proposals. In fact, somebody wrote an article, it was quite thought provoking, to say, you know, what did the United States do in 1945? when it uh, put an atom bomb in Japan. I mean, <laughs> that clearly was, you know, an awful lot of civilians uh, died in that one. Uh, and yet, what happened was Hiroshima and Nagasaki, what happened was that initiated a permanent peace that has lasted more than 80 years, and Japan is a very strong ally of the United States. So hey, you know, uh, Israel uh, admires America so much. Uh, why don't they fight the war like America won World War II? And yet, and yet, I think Jewish ethics do not allow that. Uh, Jewish ethics requires some type of balance of compassion, even against the enemy, at least with, with respect to the non-combatants. And that's the difficulty that we're facing. Yeah. With the breakdown of marriage in secular society, um, the unfortunate development of what's called open marriage, often by Goyim, where both the husband and wife mutually agree that it's okay for us to see other partners. Is such a marriage con still considered marriage? And when they see other partners, are they, consider are they committing adultery under Shepherd Mrs. Noah? Yeah, that's a very, very interesting issue about, the, God forbid, uh, the open marriage. So first of all, let me point out that uh, the man is fine because halakhically a man can have more than one wife, uh, Del Raisa, and under the Noahide law for sure, he can have more than one wife. So provided he's not with a married woman, <laughs> he's not guilty of adultery for sure. The question is, uh, is the woman guilty? Meaning to say, if we have a marriage, and let's say a Noahide marriage, uh, which is just agreeing to be married, but the understanding is it's an open marriage, so the question is, maybe under the Noahide law, that's not a marriage. Me meaning to say, marriage, by definition, is a relationship of exclusivity. So instead of looking at it as adultery, you would simply say that shows they never intended to have a marriage. That's a very excellent point, meaning there would be a difference between we got married and later we decided to change the rules, in which case for sure that would be adultery. That's not a question. But you're raising the question, if it was understood bishas maisa that it's going to be an open marriage, so the argument is the man never intended to create a marital bond with his wife. That, that actually is an excellent spur, but I, I, I have to check it. I don't, I don't have an answer, but I think that's very much a possibility. Yeah. So over Rosh Hashanah, I heard this uh, idea that when Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbat, as it did uh, this year, um, that the sign that either, the, either the year is going to be incredibly good or incredibly bad. And as we see it now, it's not looking incredibly bad. Could, could you just expound on that a little bit? So there is a Gemara that says... Uh, it's based on a pun, because the word trua is both the shofar blowing and meriin, bad thing. So it says, kol shana she'ein meriin la bitchilasa. Any year that you don't blow the shofar at the beginning, meriin la will have bad things, besofa. That's what it says, actually bad things. However, most Rishonim don't apply it to this situation. Most Rishonim say that doesn't apply when it's Shabbos. Shabbos takes the place of shofar. It applies where it's not Shabbos, and for whatever reason, the community didn't blow shofar. That's going to be bad. So the technical application of that passage does not apply this year. However, you're right. Some later commentaries have, 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 have tried to apply it to our situation. But that's not the Pashtus of the Gemara. That, that whatever we didn't get with shofar, we got with Shabbos. Shabbos is love, and Shabbos is forgiveness. And you know, listen, uh, the years of World War II, they did blow shofar and Rosh Hashanah. You know, so this is not, uh, there are not guarantees uh, one, way, one way or the other. But if a community deliberately didn't blow shofar when they could have blown shofar, that is a very, very bad, sorry, bad why sign. Why did they blow shofar during World War II on Shabbat? 
No, no, no. I was just saying that there were years which which were, was not Shabbat, and you know, it didn't stop anything. Yeah. Um, during Rosh Hashanah, any time like Am Yisrael is seen as a very uh, moving event, or you know, it could be for good, let's say like like Matan Torah or Kriyat uh, Yamsuf, it had it had effect for a certain amount of time, and then after um, Am Yisrael passed away and lost that memory. And like even the Six Day War, you know, and um, I guess also unfortunately even like for tragedy that we've seen, uh, like these memories have like ebbed away from our mind. I guess uh, how, how can we ensure that this won't? And like, I, I remember if we have every dog in our pocket, we'll do it or not. But, like, how do we ensure that? In, you know, the truth is that uh, I, I would venture to say, although I, although I hate to say it this way, that, that Baruch Hashem and it should continue. It should continue. Be Ezra Hashem continue. Yushalayim has been in a relative state of peace. And we don't even feel that, you know, less than 100 kilometers from here, it's, it's really hell on earth. So even Lagabi, this Milchama, during the Milchama, we get less sensitive as the days go by. You know, people are dying. There are people who are captured and hostages every single day. But, and Baruch Hashem, it should continue. Baruch Hashem, you know, here we're, we're doing okay. And it needs constant renewal, constant thinking about the fact that people are suffering. They need our prayers. They need our learning. They need our support. You know, I got an email yesterday that some nine-year-old kid, Oded, um, uh, was celebrating, celebrating his ninth birthday in captivity. And uh, there was a campaign to send uh, messages, email messages, th tens of thousands of messages, and demand that the, the Red Cross deliver it to the boy on his birthday. And uh, just think, and, and you know, I, I wrote something myself. And there is an idea of uh, we need even psychically to send messages. I mean, I believe in such a thing, that, that they should know that we're with them and we're thinking about them. And you can lose the intensity even in the middle of the war. It doesn't have to be after the Milchama. Now, Baruch Hashem, one of the silver clouds, has been, there's been tremendous achdus and unity among Am Yisrael, which was suffering tremendously before this war started. But what's going to be when Be'ezra Hashem, this war ends very, very soon? Is it going to be business as usual? Let's go back to our regular fighting. Well, the track record says yes. That's been, that's been the, the, the past. We have to think about this. You know, uh, people were saying it with COVID. You know, people were saying with COVID, when shuls were closed, you know, when shuls reopen, it's going to be new, it's going to be different. Um, I, I think the experience has been, no. <laughs> it's been exactly what it was before COVID. And tragically, this could be the same thing after this. So we got to really think about ourselves. Like, what, what will the new world look like? Of course, if the world is Mashiach, that'll be the answer. But if, if, if Chas Hashem is not Mashiach and we're still going to deal with this world, you know, what can we do to make it better? And it's something to say, it's something we need to devote a lot of thought about. Okay, I'm going to stop here, but uh, well and have a good Shabbos.